Everyone doing all right tonight? Everyone doing all right tonight? All right, very good. Well, uh, I want to, uh, first of all, say thank you for allowing me to come back. Uh, I was here last year. And how many of you were here last year? All right. Well, let me, I, I want to ask it a different way. How many of you weren't here last year when we did this? Wow, where were you? All right. <laughs> Well, I'm glad that uh, we have so many people here tonight, and I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what our objective here is tonight. When the pastor mentioned that scripture, and it's in Luke chapter 24, when the two disciples were on the road to Emmaus, and they encountered a stranger who asked them, why do you look so sad, and what are you talking about? And they said, well, the one that we thought was the Redeemer of Israel, was delivered up, he was crucified this morning. Some of the people in our group went to his tomb, and it was empty, and this is the third day. And of course, he had told them on multiple occasions that he would rise on the third day, but they're, um, they're dismayed because apparently they're not really certain about what's going on. Now, everybody knows who the stranger is that they encountered, right? Okay. So they don't recognize him. They don't see him. And that's funny because they had been following him. These were disciples. These weren't strangers to him. But they didn't recognize him. And so, as they're walking along, it says that he asked them, Why are you so slow to believe all that the prophets have written? Ought not the Messiah to have suffered these things and then entered into his glory? And then beginning at Moses, which is the Torah, the five books of Moses, Beginning at Moses and the prophets, he began to expound to them all the things that were spoken of him. So the Messiah took some of his disciples to what Moses had written, what all the prophets had written, because everything they had written was all about him. And I want to start out on, on that thought this evening, because unfortunately, and um, well, it's just the way it has been. You know, as believers, we don't spend as much time in the quote-unquote Old Testament as we do in the New Testament. But the reality is, if you were to extract all of the quotes that Paul uses when he quotes a prophet or he quotes Moses, and if you took all the quotes that, that Jesus used, and who I will now refer to by his Hebrew name, Yeshua, when he would quote Moses and the different prophets, if we removed all of that from the New Testament... You wouldn't have a whole lot of New Testament left. So I'm one of those people that I believe that it's God's word from beginning to end. And so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to go back into what Moses wrote and what the prophets have written to show us that these things were written of him. And oh, by the way, kind of to complete that story, when they got to Emmaus, and they got to the place that they were traveling to, he acted like he was going to continue on. And they compelled him to come into the house. Now you have to keep in mind that this was on the day of the resurrection. And so it was already into the week of the feast of unleavened bread, matzah. And he went into the house with them. And he took matzah. He took bread, it said, but it would have been unleavened bread. He took matzah and he broke it and he blessed. And when he did that, then their eyes were opened. So I want you to keep that in mind when we start breaking the matzah tonight. That as he broke matzah, their eyes were opened and they saw him for who he is. And I want us tonight to see him for who he is in a much deeper and a richer way. All right? Because he, on the eve of his crucifixion, sat down with his disciples and he said, As oft as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And you and I have heard that and we quote that when we do communion. I'm going to suggest to you, and I'm going to demonstrate it for you here in a little bit, that what you and I recognize as communion is basically an abbreviation of what we're going to do tonight. Because you'll have to remember that, you know, Jesus wasn't a Baptist. That was John, right? He was a Jewish rabbi. And the context of all that, that he said that night and all they did that night was within the context of Passover. Now, I grew up in a Pentecostal church, 
And my introduction to Passover was through Cecil B. DeMille, Charlton Heston, Yul Brenner, and all those guys, you know. Oh, yeah, a lot of people nodding their head, yeah. So, you know, when I first started sitting down and learning about Passover, you know, my first thing was, oh, well, that's, that's what Jewish people do. But I come to understand that Passover and all the other feasts that are mentioned in the scripture aren't Jewish feasts. Actually, they're the Creator's feasts. He said, they're my feasts, they're my festivals. And so what we're going to do tonight as we go through this, we are going to remember him. Because he said, as often as you do this, he was talking about Passover. When you do this, remember me. So that's going to be our objective tonight. We want to remember him and we want to see him in a way perhaps that many of us have not. Not that it takes away from anything or is trying to add to anything. It's just that we want to go a little deeper. Now, let's talk about some logistical things here real quick and then we'll proceed. On the table, uh, you should have some the basic elements and um, very quickly we'll, we'll go through those. You've got, um, I'm assuming here, you've got what I've got up here. You've probably got a little green vegetable, some parsley or something like that. There is probably a little dish of, looks like prepared horseradish. Um, first time I did this, they called it Jewish Dristan. You'll find out why later. <laughs> there is a mixture here in a bowl. It's called choroset. And it's a sweet mixture, it's apples and cinnamon and things like that. There should be a little bowl of salty water. Now, I don't know that you'll have it on your table, but I have the shank bone of a lamb. And I'll explain all these things in detail later. But we have all these basic elements, and some of them are things that the scripture tells us to do. Some of them are customary, and I'll try to distinguish for you between the two, what's commanded and what's customary. But we're going to partake of that in a little bit. Also, you have on your table, or you should have, these, matzah, unleavened bread. And we're going to eat this in a little bit. How many of you have never had unleavened bread before, matzah before? Oh, okay, several of you. You're in for a treat. <laughs> also, you should have some grape juice on your table uh, with a cup. And I'm going to tell you, go ahead, if you have a cup there, go ahead and start filling those cups with the grape juice because we're going to use that here in just a moment. So if someone will at the table kind of officiate and be in charge of that and help everyone get their cups filled with the grape juice. And now there's one other thing before we proceed. We're going to use a little booklet here. I've got one here. It's called, the, it's called a Haggadah. Haggadah comes from a Hebrew word that means to tell. And so we're going to tell the story of the Passover. Because this is one of the things that we're instructed to do. We're instructed to do these things year after year. And we tell the story. We remember. We also are instructed in Deuteronomy to teach our children diligently. All these things that the Creator has commanded us. And so... Many, many centuries ago, it was decided we're going to put the story of Passover in a little booklet because we're going to sit down each year and we're going to repeat this again and again. There's a Hebrew term, mikra, that means a rehearsal. And so they believed that they were rehearsing. Every time they sat down to observe the Passover, they were rehearsing for something. And for 1,500 years, Israel rehearsed for the Lamb. Because we go back in the story... And I'm, I'm kind of rambling here for just a few minutes. We're going to get started. Um, but if you, if you think about it, the story of Passover is how God's people, in order to be redeemed, had to place their trust in the blood of a lamb. They had to place their trust in the blood of a lamb. They were enslaved. They were in bondage. There was nothing that they could do to free themselves. The Creator was going to redeem them. But He had one requirement, and that is you're going to take this male lamb of the first year without a spot or wrinkle. You're going to slaughter it on a certain day at a certain time, and then you're going to take a hyssop branch, and you're going to take the blood of that lamb, and the father of the house is going to take the blood of that lamb, and he's going to post it upon the doorposts and lintels of your home. Because in Exodus 12, the Creator said, because I'm going to pass through the land of Egypt tonight, 
and I'm going to strike down the firstborn of Egypt, both man and beast from Pharaoh's house down to the prison cell. But when I see the blood, it'll be a sign between you and me. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, when I was a kid and, and watched that movie with Cecil D. B. DeMille and Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner and all those guys, the scene that just struck me and, and stood out in my mind for just for years, really made a big impression on me, was the night of the Passover. And if you'll remember Joshua, who was in love with Lilia, remember Deborah Paget, right? John Derrick was Joshua and uh, Deborah Paget was Lilia, and he was in love with Lilia, and she was the firstborn. And the problem here was because Dathan, who was Edward G. Robinson, who was a bad guy, had taken Lilia into his house as his servant. And being a bad guy, of course, Edward G. Robinson's always the bad guy, right? He's not going to put blood on the door of his home. And Joshua was afraid that if something, uh, he doesn't do something, then Lily is going to die. And so in the movie, remember, he runs over and he takes blood and he's putting it on the doorpost of Edward G. Robinson's house. And he has to hurry because the green fog's already coming down out of the sky. It's already hit the ground and it's moving, creeping along the ground and the road and people are clutching their throats and already falling over and he's hurrying up. And you remember the green fog meander down the road. It got to Edward G. Robinson's house and kind of hesitated for a minute, thinking, this is Edward G. Robinson's house. What's that blood doing up there? <laughs> but then he had to move on by. Here's the point I wanted to make. Because this is the essence of the story. The creator said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And I, I used to think as a kid that what he was saying was, when I see the blood, I'll pass by you. I'll pass by that house. I won't strike down the firstborn of that house. I'll just keep moving and pass on by. But what it really means is this. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. As a mother hen would extend her wings and pass over her chicks to shield and protect them from the danger that's impending. Because in Exodus 12, Moses told the children of Israel, when the Lord sees the blood, he will pass over you and will not allow the destroyer to enter into your homes. You see, the destroyer was the one who had to pass by because the creator passed over. So what I want you to see is that in that Old Testament, way back there with what Moses wrote, the creator was already telling us what he was going to do. When he sees the blood... He passes over our house. He passes over our families. He passes over us. And he does not permit the destroyer to come in and to wreak havoc in our homes, in our families. Because it's always been about the blood of the Lamb. All right? Now, if you want to follow with me in Haggadah, they've got plenty of them back there. If you want one, you can follow along with me. If you don't, uh, if you just want to listen, that's fine too. But if you want one, raise your hand real quick, and they'll pass those out for you. And we're going to go ahead and dive into this. Now, usually a Seder, and by the way, I need to tell you what that word is. A Seder is a Hebrew word that means an, it's the order of something. And so we're going to go through the order of it. That's what Seder is. And what are we going to go through the order of? Observing the Passover. Because actually, Passover is not a day. Passover is the lamb, the Pesach. And so the focal point of everything is always the lamb. And so if uh, you want to look in that Haggadah as they pass it out on page 3, we're not going to read all of this. But our Jewish brethren right now are preparing for Passover. And for them, what that means is they're going through the house right now to look for everything that contains leaven or yeast, chametz in the Hebrew. Chametz is a word that means to sour, and it means to ferment. And so they're going through the house, <clears throat> pardon me, they're going through the house to look for everything that has any kind of yeast, any fermentation, any, anything that's, um, well, let's put it this way, that puffs up. Because chametz or leaven in Scripture is 
emblematic of sin, that, that evil inclination that's within, in, within each of us. So they're going through their homes literally to remove everything that is emblematic of sin, leavened bread. And this is all going to culminate for them on Friday because Friday evening will be the fort, uh, beginning of the 15th day of the month Aviv in Hebrew when they will sit down and they will observe the Passover. So there's a lot of preparation that goes into it. And then Friday night when they sit down, mom will come to the table and she will light the candles as the sun begins to set. And this is a custom. This is not something we find commanded in the scripture. It's a custom. But they would light the candles because we're entering into a Shabbat, a Sabbath. And on a Sabbath, you're not supposed to do any work. You're not supposed to kindle a fire, all these things. And so if you think about it, before the days of electricity, if, it was, if the sun was going down and you needed to do something, but you can't kindle a fire after the Sabbath, you're going to light some candles before it gets dark. And so what was necessary kind of became a tradition and a custom. But this custom began to speak to them about things, about concepts. And one of those customs is that when we light the candles of a, a special day like Passover, we light two customarily because everything has to be established by two or more witnesses. And I quoted you a scripture that the pastor quoted you as well in Luke chapter 24. Remember the two disciples? And they're walking down the road and they encounter the stranger and they're having this discussion. And he says, why are you so slow to believe all that the prophets have written? And beginning at Moses and the prophets, he began to expound to them all the things that were written of himself. In other words, he went to the Moses or the, the Torah, the law of the Moses and the prophets as the witnesses that he is the light of the world. And so the, the mother of the house, the lady of the house, she would kindle the lights. Why the mother? Because back in Genesis chapter 3, the creator said to the woman, through you, I'm going to bring forth the seed of the woman. And he is going to crush the head of the serpent. He'll have his heel bruised in the process, but he will destroy the works of the devil according to 1 John 3. And so she kindles the lights, speaking symbol, symbolically of the light world. And there has to be those two witnesses that testify that Jesus, Yeshua, is the Messiah, the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, who was standing there with him. Moses and Elijah. Moses represents the law, the Torah. Elijah represents the prophets. Because when we go to the scripture, the scriptures testify that he is the light of the world. And so the mom would light the candles and we would initiate this very special time. Now, if you are looking in the Haggadah on page six, it talks about the four cups of wine. Now, obviously, we have grape juice. But grape juice, wine, in the Seder, in the Passover, the wine is supposed to symbolize joy. Now, if this were wine, and we drank about four cups full, can you imagine why it would represent joy? <laughs> Now, no, I'm talking to Baptist, and I, I was grew up Pentecostal, so we do grape juice. But the, the idea is that it's emblematic of joy because this is supposed to be a joyous time. Somber, yes, we reflect on the fact that the Messiah suffered and died on our behalf, but that brings us joy that because we are now reconciled back to the creator of the universe. We can boldly approach the throne of grace. We are reconciled to our Father. And so that should bring us joy, even as we reflect on the costs that were involved. So we're going to drink from the cup four different times. And the first one is called Kiddush. That's a Hebrew term. It means to set apart, to sanctify. Our English word would be holy. The creator says, I am holy. And then he says, now I want you to be holy. In other words, we are to emulate him. We are to, uh, we are to aspire to replicate 
His holiness in the earth because God always from the very beginning has worked in and through his people. And so every time we do something that is special like this, that is considered a holy day, we have to do something to signify we're setting it apart. Mom lit the candles. That was the sign we are going into a very unique time of a special time, a set apart time. And so dad would take the cup. And he would invite everybody to join him by taking the cup, preferably in your right hand if you're right-handed. On page 6 of the Haggadah, it quotes Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. He says, I will free you from the bondage of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their oppression. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, and I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. And if you look very carefully at that, you will notice he said there's four specific things that he was going to do. I'm going to free you. I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to redeem you. And I'm going to take you as my people. And so that's the idea of why we have four cups during the course of the evening. But this first one, as I said, is called Kiddush. It means to sanctify. It means to set apart. And so the customary blessing is, and if you know it, you can recite it with me. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Borei pri hagafen, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. On page 7 of the Haggadah, it says, And as he began his final Passover Seder, Yeshua the Messiah shared a cup with his disciples and said to them, Take this and share it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And so I want you to begin to notice now as we go through this that there are things that we're going to do that in a very similar way the Messiah did on the eve of his crucifixion. So they were sitting down to partake of the Passover, and one of the first things that he did as he led them is he took that cup and he says, now I want you all to share this. This is a very unique and a set-apart time. Notice now, he didn't drink of that cup. There was another cup that he had to partake of, right? But he did say this, I'll paraphrase. I'm not going to drink it with you until we do it new in the kingdom. So there is a bit of anticipation in things that we do tonight. We, we are going to reflect. We're going to remember him. As often as you do this, remember me. But we're also going to look forward because he just said in Luke chapter, what was it, Luke chapter 22, that one day he's going to take this cup and he's going to share it with us and he's going to partake in the kingdom. Now, the only meal that I can think of that the scripture alludes to or refers to that is going to take place in the future, what's it called? It's the marriage supper of the lamb. So the focus of that particular supper meal is going to be a lamb. I'm going to recommend something to you. The marriage supper of the Lamb is when the Messiah is going to sit down with all of his people and he's going to lead us in the observance of the Passover and he is going to take the cup and share it with us in the kingdom. So what we're doing tonight, again, we're looking back, we're remembering, but we're also looking forward. We're practicing. It's a mikra, it's a rehearsal. The children of Israel rehearsed 1,500 years for the lamb that would come and take away the sins of the world. You and I remember the lamb, but we're also re looking forward and rehearsing for a time when we will sit down with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords at the marriage supper of the lamb. On page eight of the Haggadah, there is a part of the Seder, the order where we wash our hands. And because we're a little bit uh, limited on time tonight, we're not going to do but it's just to bring to your attention that 
everything that we're doing, again, there, in some way, in a very similar fashion, the Messiah and his disciples did this 2,000 years ago. We would wash our hands. The, the head of the home would take a pitcher of water, and he would go around and wash everybody's hands, pour water over their hands. It was ceremonial, yes, but how many of us grew up in a time and a place when you came to sit down at mom's table, first thing you had to do was go in the bathroom and wash your hands and face. You don't come to the table with a dirty face or dirty hands, right? Thank you, all one of you. That <laughs> We wash up before we go to the table. In the Hebrew culture, the table is likened unto the altar. And so when we come to the table, it's a special time. It's, it's, for lack of a better word, sacred. And so they're very, very particular about when we, especially when we have a special time like this, we make sure to wash our hands to show the Creator we are coming to sit at the table with clean hands. Now, spiritually speaking, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in His holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Because what we are doing here tonight, we have come to the Lord's table. When Paul talks about the Lord's table, he's talking about what happens at Passover. And so it only makes sense that we're going to wash our hands physically, but more importantly, we, do make, we need to make sure that if we're going to come to his table, we have clean hands and a pure heart, right? Because according to Paul's admonition, we do not want to partake of this unworthily. Because there are bad things happen when people do it unworthily. And so when we wash our hands, it should be a provocation for us to search our hearts. To purge our hearts of anything that is contrary to the will of our Father. To purge from our lives those things that are not fruitful and not conducive to His will for our life. And so, in, Luke, uh, excuse me, in John chapter 13, I'm on page 8 of the Haggadah, if you're following along. It says, Then he, that is the Messiah, poured some water into a basin and began to wash the feet of the disciples and wiped them off with the towel wrapped around him. And he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me Rabbi, which means teacher, and Lord, and you're right. Because I am. Now, if I, the Lord and Rabbi, have washed your feet, you also should wash each other's feet. And so it was at this point in the Seder that not only did they wash hands, did he pour water over their hands, presumably, but he also took that water and he began to wash their feet in an act of humility. There are two primary commandments that are given to us. Can you tell me what they are? And the one that's like unto that, love your neighbor as yourself. Can I give you my opinion? The latter one, the second one, is harder than the first one. My opinion, but loving my neighbor as myself, I believe is the hardest commandment in all of Scripture. But it's really important that you and I learn to do that because we are also told, if I don't love my neighbor then I really don't love God with all my heart, my soul, and my strength. And everything we do, as far as obedience goes, hangs on those two commands. To love God with all of our heart, soul, and strength, that means to love God with everything. And to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so what was the Messiah teaching us? That we have to humble ourselves we have to say no to ourselves. The reason you and I were born again was so that we could learn how to die. Right? We were born again in order to learn how to die to our will, to say no to me, to say no to my will, my desires, my opinions, my agenda. The Messiah humbles himself and he washes the feet of his students, his disciples, teaching them that if you're going to be a follower of mine, you're going to have to take up your cross, which is to say, I'm going to deny myself and follow me. 
And so the washing of the hands also brings to mind these things. Because who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? The one who has clean hands, but also a pure heart. In fact, the Hebrew word there, pure, could also be rendered son. To have the heart of a son. You and I, when we were born again of the incorruptible seed that is the Messiah, we began the process of being conformed to the image of the Son of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but when we see Him, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Mortal will put on immortality. Corruption will put on incorruption. To as many as received Him, to them He gave the power that is the right and the ability to become what? The Son's of God. And so the son, what did he say? What the father told him to say. The son, what did he do? What the father told him to do. And his example of servitude is, well, it's, it builds up to the point when he goes to the father and he says, if it were possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Pure heart. On page nine, we're going to actually eat something now. Parsley. <laughs> and the reason we have a green vegetable, sometimes it's parsley, it's lettuce. Some, you know, we, we like cilantro at my house because I just like cilantro. But the idea is to eat a green vegetable because we're in the month, in Hebrew it's called Aviv. And in Exodus chapter 12, the Creator spoke to Moses and he said, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. Now, we begin the, the year in January when everything's dead. That, that makes sense. <laughs> That's logical. Everything's dead, barren, drab, gloomy. You! Happy New Year. But the Creator says, when everything that was dead is now being resurrected, when everything that was bleak and drab and dry and gloomy is now springing into life and blooming and, and, and it's coming back and the colors are out there. One of the things I love most about living in Tennessee is all of the different shades of green during spring. Right? It's just like, I lived in Florida for 10 years. They have two seasons in Florida, hot and doggone hot, right? <laughs> so we didn't see those different greens and colors at springtime. So Aviv, that it means it's springing up. Things that were dead are being resuscitated and revived. And so the Creator says, this month is going to be the beginning of months for you, which makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Because it's things coming back to life. And so that's why, or one of the reasons why, we eat a green vegetable. To be reminded, this happens when everything is turning green again. But also, with this parsley, it's customary to take it, and we're going to do this in just a moment, to dip it in salty water. Why? Well, some people like salt on their vegetables. But there's a lot of symbolism in it, too. And one of the things that has been handed down to us through the, the centuries is that it calls to mind that when Israel was coming out of Egypt, that God brought them to a place called the Mouth of the Gorges. This is in Exodus chapter 14. You see, Moses knew the way from Egypt to Mount Sinai. He had already gone there and back. But in Exodus 14, God told them to turn, and he led them into a gorge. Now, you know what a gorge is, a ravine. In that part of the world, it's called a wadi. And that means that there are canyon walls on this side and there are walls on this side. And you can't turn to the right and you can't turn to the left. You have to keep going straight. In fact, it's a, a straight and narrow path. And he brings them into that straight and narrow path. And when they get to the mouth of the gorge, what's in front of them? A sea. And who's behind them? Pharaoh and his chariots. And everybody's closing, everything's closing in on them. And, and a lot of them think that God has brought them out there to kill them. That's when Edward G. Robinson went up to Charlton Heston. Hey, see, you brought us out here to kill us, see? And, you know. I do a much better Yule Brenner. I'll get to that. 
But what happened? God, with a blast from his nostrils, he opened up the waters and they walked through on a dry path. And once they had emerged from the sea and Pharaoh pursues them with all of his chariots and God causes those waters to close in on Pharaoh and God destroyed their enemies. They witnessed this. And so when they came up on the other side of that salty water, they were born again. And so when we dip the vegetable in the salty water, we remember that God opened up a sea of salt, so to speak. And he caused his people to come up on the other side. If I can use this terminology, a new creation. They were no longer in bondage to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, the only one who could lay claim to them, was lying at the bottom of the sea. But we also remember something else, or at least I do. This is something I always try to point out to my family every time we do this. You'll remember when Yeshua, the Messiah, was hanging on the tree, hanging on the cross, and he said, I thirst. Someone took a hyssop branch, and they dipped it in vinegar that had been mingled with gall, and they put it to his mouth, and he refused it. And so the green vegetable, to me, is reminiscent of the fact that during the Messiah's suffering, you know, that hyssop was there, that bitter or you know, unpleasant taste was something they put to his mouth. And so what we want to do is take, if everyone will take a little piece of the parsley. And just go ahead and dip it into the salty water. And I'm going to recite a blessing in Hebrew. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the earth. And so if you'll eat that. You should also have some water on your table. You're probably going to need that. On page 10 of the Haggadah, there is a part of the order of the service. It's called Manishtana, which means, why is this night different? And the idea here is, this is not something just for adults. This is something for children. In fact, this is something we're supposed to be teaching to our children. They're supposed to carry it forth and teach it to their children. That's how you remember things. And so this is, in some ways, it's a family story that gets passed down through the generations. And every generation, when the children come to something that's unique and special, well, I mean, it's just a child's natural curiosity to come up with questions of, you know, why are we doing this? Why, we don't do this uh, any other night. Why are we doing this tonight? Why is it so special? And so um, the rabbis just kind of built that, uh, that element into it. And we're not going to take a lot of time with this tonight, but I will read you the four questions. On page 11, it says, how different is this night from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat bread or unleavened bread or matzah. On this night, we only eat matzah. On all other nights, we eat all kinds of vegetables. But on this night, we only eat bitter herbs. On all other nights, we do not dip our vegetables even once. But on this night, why do we dip them twice? We just dip the, the green vegetable into the salty water. On all other nights, we eat our meals sitting or reclining. On this night, why do we eat only reclining? Now, and so when the children would ask their different questions, the father would be uh, obligated to try to answer them. And so I'm going to kind of sit in the role of dad tonight. And you have come up with all these questions, and so I need to try to answer them. That's my responsibility. We are to teach our children diligently. And I'm going to tackle the fourth question first because when you read that, I'm sure some people thought, what is this whole reclining thing? Well, you have to keep in mind that in a different culture, 2,000 years ago, at a meal like this, they didn't sit in chairs or on stools like this. They threw pillows around the table and they would, they would recline. They would just eat kind of halfway laying down, lying down. And that came to be customary in the Passover Seder 
Because on this night, we are being liberated from our bondage. It's remembering that we were freed from slavery. And so we weren't slaves anymore because our God is the king of kings. He has made us kings and priests. And so we can, we can eat as children of the king. And so that's the whole idea behind the reclining. Now, in a setting like this, that's not going to work so well. That's why you're sitting in a chair and not reclining. All right. So I've answered the first question, which was actually the last question. But now we're going to talk about some of the more uh, notable elements on the table. And so I want you to, uh, someone at your table, go ahead and start taking some matzah. And I want you to go ahead and begin to distribute it. And while you're doing that, I want to talk about the matzah a little bit. Matzah just means unleavened bread. It's um, This comes from a... A factory where they made it but they made it a certain way according to tradition and so as you get a piece of matzo I want you to notice that it's probably going to have some brown spots all over it and if you hold it up to the light you'll notice something you see all those holes there now why are those holes there tradition why are those brown splotches on there? Tradition. Here's why they make it that way. In antiquity, when they would make matzah, and the Samaritans still do this to this day, they'll build a fire and they have these devices, and I'm, I don't remember the name right now, my, my, my mind just went blank on me there, but it's like a dome-like, a half dome-like device that they would put over the fire and it's metal, and so that heat would build up there, and they would basically have this griddle out there in the open space, and then they would make their dough, and of course you gotta make it up real quick, you can't allow, allow it to uh, sit and let, the, uh, let it ferment, and so they make the dough up, and they pat it out, and they put these, these cakes of dough on this griddle, and it would cook. Well, you know, the fire's going underneath there, so it doesn't always cook evenly. You know, you're going you're gonna to get brown spots. You're going to get burn spots on it. And to make sure that it didn't rise, that it remained unleavened, they would take pins and they would poke holes in it. They would pierce it. And they would put all these holes in it. And so when they took it off, it was pierced and it was bruised. So we come into the modern era and the rabbinical ruling was, we want to stay in touch with our traditions. And so the bread is made purposely to have these burnt places on it and those holes in it. Because it's really important that the matzah be bruised and pierced. You're already with me on this, right? You know, and, and this is something I, I always like to point out. I mean, it's no secret that our, our Jewish friends do not see, they don't recognize Jesus, Yeshua, as being the Messiah. But there's a lot of things, a lot of customs that they built into the Passover Seder that I find so interesting, this being one of them. And the end result is that those people who don't recognize Jesus as being the Messiah do things to teach us that Jesus is the Messiah. Tell me God's not in control. All right? And remember, when were the eyes of the two disciples opened? When he broke the bread. When he broke the matzah. Now, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're on page 12 of the Haggadah. He says, don't you know the saying, it takes only a little chametz or leaven to leaven a whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old leaven or the old chametz. Remember what I told you chametz means? It means to ferment. It means to sour. It's representative of a, the evil inclination, the sin nature. Get rid of the old chametz so that you can be a new batch of dough because in reality you are unleavened. Let me, let me introduce this concept to you or maybe not introduce it to you. Maybe you already knew this. But whatever the Messiah is, that's what we're supposed to be. Right? He's the Son of God. We're being conformed to the image of the Son of God. He is the seed of Abraham. 
Paul says in Galatians 3, verse 29, that if you are in Messiah, anybody here in Messiah? Anybody belong to Messiah? Let me, let me see. Pastor, count me count. Let's see who's raising their hand. <laughs> All right. If you are Messiahs, then you are the seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. Right? He is the seed of the woman. In Revelation 12, there are those who keep his commandments and who have a relationship with the Messiah. They're called the remnant of her seed. He's the good seed that is sown in the parable of the sower because he's the word of God. But that good seed is sown in Matthew 13 in the parable of the wheat and the tare, and it produces the wheat, which are the sons of the kingdom. So whatever he is, that's what we're supposed to be. And so if he is representing the unleavened bread, or excuse me, if he's representative of the unleavened bread, or he represents him, then no wonder that Paul says that we are unleavened. Because we're in him. So we purge these things from our lives. We were born again in order to learn how to die so that we become unleavened, if you will. For our Pesach, or our Passover lamb, the Messiah, has been sacrificed. And that's how you and I can be unleavened. Not because of us. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It's not through anything we could do. Israel could not free themselves from Egyptian bondage. Israel could not liberate themselves and redeem themselves from their taskmasters. The only thing they could do was to trust in the blood of a lamb. And because they placed their trust in the blood of a lamb, God redeemed them from their bondage. And he made them a people. And so likewise with us, we put our trust in our Pesach, our Passover lamb, the Messiah. And because of that, we are redeemed and we are made unleavened. Now, I don't know that you have it on your table, but on my table, I've got a, um, a bag here. It's a little cover. And it's called a Motsutosh. Sometimes it's called a unity bag. And the reason it's called a unity bag is because... in uh, I hope it's okay for me to say this. Maybe later you want to come up and look at it and just to verify what I'm telling you. But this bag has three compartments in it. There's one, two, three compartments. But it's called a unity bag. So it's three in unity. Remember, we didn't come up with this custom. Those people who don't believe Yeshua is the Messiah came up with this custom. All right? So there's three compartments, and in those three compartments, we have three pieces of, of matzah, just like this. Now, during the, uh, the Seder, what will happen is Dad will take out not the top piece and not the bottom piece, but the middle piece. Now, there's lots of traditions as to what those pieces of matzah represent. And the prevailing idea is that the three pieces of matzah are, are in there to represent Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so, in effect, what happens then is dad will take out the piece of matzah that represents Isaac. Now, who was Isaac? Isaac was the promised seed. He was the one who his mother conceived him after the time that she was supposed to be able to do this. You could say it was kind of a miraculous conception, right? He was the promised seed. And at a certain time in Genesis 22, the, the creator decided it was time to test Abraham. And so he told Abraham, I want you to take your only son, the son you love, Isaac. And I want you to take him to a place that I'm going to show you in the land of Moriah. And there I want you to, and this is the way it could be rendered, most literally, I want you to lift him up as a burnt offering. And so early the next morning, Abraham gathers the wood. He gets everything that he's going to need for the sacrifice. He gets his son. He gets two of his servants. They saddle the donkeys and they, they take their journey to the land of Moriah. And then in Genesis chapter 22, verse 4, it says, And on the third day, 
he lifted up his eyes and he saw he saw the place off in the distance and then he turned to his two servants he said now you wait here me and the lad are going yonder to worship and we are returning to you and why did he say that because the writer of Hebrews says and I'll paraphrase it he says because Abraham believed God and God had already told them that in Isaac shall your seed be called and that in Abraham's heart, because he believed God, if Isaac were to die that day, God would be obligated by his promise to raise him up from the dead. And if he was going to raise him up that day, it would have been on the third day. So he then takes the wood and places it on Isaac. And the Hebrew term there, wood, is literally tree or branch of a tree. So he took the branch of a tree and he laid it on Isaac. And I kind of, in my mind's eye, see him carrying it on his shoulder. And as Isaac is walking the wood up to the top of the mountain in order to be lifted up as a burnt offering, he turns to his father and he says, Father, I see the wood in the fire, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? God will provide himself the lamb. By the way, it was a ram caught in the thicket. You see, Abraham saw something that gave him confidence that he and Isaac were returning. Messiah said it this way, Abraham saw my day. He saw it and he rejoiced in it. I'm convinced that what Abraham saw in Genesis 22 verse 4 is he saw the resurrected Lamb of God. And that's what gave him confidence to get through the most difficult trial that he had ever been subjected to. So Isaac is a picture of the promised son, the promised seed who is going to be lifted up and he's going to walk to the top of the mountain obediently submitting to his father's will. Because you have to figure that at a certain point it dawned on Isaac, especially when Abraham bound him. And never do we read that Isaac resisted. So, when the father reaches in and takes the middle piece of matzah out, he's taking the one that is connected to Isaac. And he, he takes that piece of matzah that's bruised, because he was bruised for our iniquities. It's striped, because by his stripes, we're healed, not just of our physical ailments, but more importantly, those heart issues, those spiritual deformities and shortcomings. And it's pierced because they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for me as one mourns for his only son. Don't you think Abraham was going through a very difficult time thinking, considering about putting his only son upon that altar. But the father will take that bread and he will break it. And then he'll take a piece of this matzo that he's just broken that represents, or it's connected to the story of Isaac, remember? He'll take a piece of this matzah that he's just broken, and he'll take a linen napkin, he'll wrap the bread in a linen napkin, he'll tell the children in the room to close their eyes while he goes and hides it, or if you'll allow me, buries it. Because later on, that piece of matzah that he, that's been broken, and that's wrapped in a linen napkin and hidden away, is going to be resurrected and it's going to become a very important part of the Passover Seder. And remember, we didn't come up with these customs. With the other piece of the matzah, he shares with the family. And so if you have a piece of matzah, I want you to take it in your hand. This particular time in the service with the, the matzahs. This is kolechem ani, which is the bread of affliction. Because we're remembering Isaac being lifted up. We're remembering the anguish of the father. We're remembering the Messiah was bruised and he was beaten and he was pierced. And so we take the bread Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzi lechem min haaretz, 
Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Real tasty, don't you think? <laughs> kind of bland, kind of dried, nothing about it that would make you desire it. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. Nothing really appealing to the flesh. Well, there's a reason for that. But this is a picture of our Messiah. Now, one of the things that we're commanded to do in addition to eating matzah or unleavened bread is we are commanded actually to eat bitter herbs. And the Hebrew term is maror. And so one of the questions you remember was, okay, why are we reclining tonight? I addressed that briefly. Why are we eating matzah tonight? Well, we're addressing that. And the other question was, or one of the other questions was, why do we eat bitter herbs? Well, because in Exodus the Creator commanded them to eat bitter herbs. But it has, it's come to represent the bitterness of bondage and slavery. We want to remember that. We don't want to dwell there, but we want to remember it. And so in Exodus chapter 1, I'm on page 15 of the Haggadah, it says, The Egyptians came to dread the people of Israel and worked them relentlessly, making their lives bitter with hard labor, digging clay, making bricks, and all kinds of field work. And so the eating of bitter herbs has become associated with the idea of the bitterness of slavery or the bitterness of bondage. And what we want to liken it to is, even though we don't want to dwell there, we want to remember the bitterness of the bondage that we were in. Because if we remember what it was like and the bondages that we found ourselves in and then were liberated and redeemed from that, then hopefully... We have something to thank God for and to acknowledge his, acknowledge his goodness in our life. And so we're going to take a piece of matzah and, if you will, dip some of the prepared horseradish on it. Now, I don't know how potent this is. It doesn't look like it's going to be all that potent, so you'll be all right. But we are going to eat the bitter herbs. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kedshadu Bidevro Vitzivanu Al Achilat Maror. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has set us apart by his word and who has commanded us to eat bitter herbs. Well, it's got a little bit. Now, what I like to do, like at home, we'll have the, the horseradish. I'll make them pile it on because the whole idea is for everybody to be going <laughs> to produce the tears that pungent feeling in your nose because you really want to experience the feeling of I'm remembering what it was like. But now we're not done because the other question was we don't dip our vegetables but tonight we're going to dip things twice. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to take a piece of matzo and we're going to dip it back in there again and we're going to eat some more and you can just go ahead and eat it. But now, I want you to take some matzah and that apple mixture that's on your table, I want you to dip some in there and make sure you get some on there and I want you to eat that. And here's what happens. The sweetness overtakes the bitterness. So we're tasting and we're seeing that the Lord is good. The sweetness overtakes and neutralizes the bitterness. But while you're enjoying that, I want to read something to you here from Mark chapter 14. I'm on page 16 of the Haggadah. As they were reclining and eating, Yeshua said, Yes, I tell you that one of you is going to betray me. And they became upset and began asking him one after the other, you don't mean me, do you? 
It is one of the twelve, he said to them. Someone dipping matzah in the dish with me. So as we were doing that, again, going back 2,000 years ago, as they were dipping matzah in the dish, that was the very time that he was acknowledging to his disciples that one of you is going to betray me tonight. And so even though this was a joyous occasion in one sense, for him it was very bittersweet. There was, there was a sting attached to it. But for the joy that was set before him, he endured the suffering of the cross. He endured the shame that was associated with it for the joy that was set before him. He looked beyond. We've already addressed the reclining. And at this point, the father would tell the story of Passover. And I'm going to just briefly summarize it because I know that most of you know the story of the Passover, or at least you should. And if you don't, you need to go back and you need to read Exodus chapter 12. And then you need to read Exodus chapter 13 and Exodus chapter 14, those three chapters specifically, and see what happened. But here's the story. There was a man by the name of Jacob who had previously lived in Syria for about 20 years. And while he was living there in Syria, he went there alone, but God multiplied him. He gave him wives. He multiplied him, gave him sons and daughters, flocks and herds. And then he said, I want you to come back into the land of your fathers. So he returned to Canaan. And while he was living in Canaan, he had a son by the name of Joseph. And Joseph was, he was the son, firstborn son through his the love of his life, Rachel. And he preferred Joseph and he gave him that special tunic that set him apart from his brothers. And of course, being the favored one and being shown this honor by give, being given this cloak, his other brothers hated him. They despised him. And of course, too, he had dreams where God would show him, I'm going to use you in this way, and I'm going to raise you up, and I'm going to put you in a place of authority and influence. And, and he shared that with everybody, and they hated him even more. And so one day, they decided that he would sh they would strip him of that coat. They were going to kill him, but they decided instead they'll sell him to Midianites who were going down into Egypt. And so he found himself down in Egypt, betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery. He ended up going to prison, falsely accused. And the reason all these things happened to him, the Bible makes it very clear, is because the favor of God was upon him. And we all want the favor of God upon our lives, right? But what becomes very apparent in the story is that if Joseph had not been sold into slavery, if he had not been tossed into prison, falsely accused, then he could not have met the cupbearer. And if it doesn't meet the cupbearer, he can't interpret his dream. And if he doesn't interpret his dream, then how does the cupbearer know to tell him to tell him tell Pharaoh about him and interpret Pharaoh's dream? And if he doesn't interpret Pharaoh's dream, then how can he be in the right place at the right time to be used of God so that all Israel is saved? If the creator gave us dreams and he said, I'm going to use you in this way and I'm going to raise you up and put you in a powerful position and authority and influence, we'd be all for that, right? But then if he said, but now here's what it's going to cost you, we'd probably think twice about it. And maybe that's why he doesn't show us everything in advance. But later on, a famine comes to the land of Canaan and that forces Joseph's brothers to go down into Egypt looking for bread. And, of course, they don't recognize their brother. He recognizes them immediately, but they don't know who he is. It's kind of like the disciples on the road to Emmaus. They don't recognize this stranger that's in front of them talking to them. But standing there is their brother. And he's providing for them, even though they don't recognize him. But finally, one day... He reveals himself to them. And when he reveals himself to them, they're reunited. 
And they're weeping and they're rejoicing. And then they go and they bring Jacob down into Egypt along with 70 souls. And so God's people are living there in Egypt. And we need to, to understand that Egypt, metaphorically speaking, is the world. You and I are in Egypt. And Egypt, the Hebrew word for Egypt, Mitzrayim, it's a place where we get squeezed. That's where the, the word comes from, Mitzrayim. It's a place where we get squeezed and pressed, you know, in a straight and narrow path. The idea behind that is to be squeezed. In fact, when the Messiah said, the straight is the gate and troublesome is the way that leads to life. That word troublesome means to be pressed, to be squeezed. And so there are times in our lives when we feel like everything's going wrong. I've been thrown into a pit. I've been sold into slavery. I've been betrayed by my brethren. I've been falsely accused and tossed into prison. And we're getting squeezed. But when Joseph comes out of the prison, he stands before Pharaoh and God gives Pharaoh an answer of peace. And then Joseph, just like that, is elevated to this great position. We see that, and he came to understand, that what people had intended for evil, God intended for good. So Egypt is where we get squeezed. And when we're going through those difficulties, we're wondering where God is in all of this. I mean, don't you think Joseph must have thought at some point in time, maybe that dream I had was because I ate something the night before that didn't agree with me. Maybe I missed it here. God, did I miss it somewhere? I've certainly prayed that prayer. But when he came out of prison, here's what Pharaoh says of him, that there is none wiser, more discreet, and full of the Spirit of God than this man. And I will submit to you that he matured in that way, not when he was in his father's house, but when he was in Egypt. And so God uses Egypt to squeeze us. And even though sometimes it feels like he's squeezing the life out of us, in reality, he's squeezing the death out of us. Because you and I were born again so that we could learn how to die. When Abraham was taking Isaac up to the top of the mountain for Isaac to be lifted up as a burnt offering. Have you ever thought about this? In Genesis 22, it says that it came time for God to test Abraham. <laughs> and yet Isaac's the one who's being, being lifted up to be a burnt offering, but God's testing Abraham. See, God never wanted or required Isaac's death. He wanted Abraham's death. That is to die completely and wholly to himself as the Messiah has set the stand before us we have to come to the place not my will but your will be done and it's one thing to say it it's another thing to do it and so God uses Egypt to squeeze us and so Jacob and these 70 they go down and they dwell in Egypt and everything was going well for them for a while until Joseph and that generation died off and then there arose this Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph now he knew who Joseph was he just didn't respect Joseph he had no respect for God's people in his land he, he looked on them in a disparaging way he saw them as a threat in fact he said they are more and mightier than we and so there was this animosity, this hatred that built up for God's people. By the way, at that point in time, all of them were living in a place that they would have called home, Egypt. By the time that Pharaoh comes along, all of God's people that are in Egypt, as far as we know, none of them were born in the land of Canaan. Egypt was what they were familiar with. But then the people around them, the Egyptians, began to look at them with hatred and contempt. They're the troublemakers. And so once again, God was using Egypt to squeeze his people. Because you see, his people had kind of assimilated into Egypt and had begun to worship the Egyptian gods right along with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The golden calf incident is evidence of that. And so God remembered that he had made a promise to Abraham long ago. And he said, 
that I am going to bring my people out of Egypt. But at that point in time, he looks upon his people and he sees that they're so connected to Egypt that you know, they're, they're not just going to leave if I send somebody and say it's time to go. I'm going to have to demonstrate to them that they don't belong here anymore. And so he raised up this man by the name of Moses, who, interestingly enough, was born in the house of a, excuse me, who was raised in the house of a man who was trying to kill him. Right? And what that says to me is, According to the parable of the wheat and the tares, the adversary likes to sow tares in the midst of the wheat. But sometimes God sows wheat in the midst of the tares. And he gets the tares to foot the bill. That's the story of Moses. He's raised up in Pharaoh's house. But when the time came, he went out among his brethren. He saw how they were being mistreated. And you know how he killed the Egyptian taskmaster and he goes into the wilderness and he has that encounter at the burning bush and if you read it very carefully it, it seems that at that point in time Moses wasn't real familiar with the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob and that's where he got his introduction that's where he came to see and have a relationship with him and so Moses goes to this Pharaoh this king and he says the God of our fathers has sent me to tell you that you're gonna have to let our people go and you need to let us go three days journey into the wilderness to keep a feast unto the Lord. Never did Moses say, you need to let us go back to the land of Canaan. Read it. And so Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I should let Israel go? I don't know who the Lord is. I don't know that God. And I'm not going to respond to that God. And then, of course, that's when he would have said, so let it be written, so let it be done. All right? I told you I did a better Joel Brenner than. All right. So Pharaoh hardens his heart and God begins to pour these plagues on it. And let's go to page 21 or 20 and 21. In Exodus 3, the creator says to Moses, I know that the king of Egypt will not let you leave unless he's forced to do so, but I will reach out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders so that I will do there and after that, he will let you go. And so there are all these plagues. There's the Niles turned to blood. There's the frogs, the lice, the beasts, or the swarms, some translations say. There's the cattle disease. There are boils breaking out on the people. There's the hail. There's the locusts and the darkness. And all of these things are intended, from the creator's point of view, to judge the gods of Egypt. That's what he was doing. All of the plagues were designed to judge the gods of Egypt. And one of the very interesting things about all of this is that the first three plagues apparently affected everybody, including the children of Israel. Because it was after the third plague that God set a distinction between Israel and between Egypt. So that when the cattle disease and the boils and the locusts and all these things were being poured out on the Egyptians, the children of Israel who were living in Goshen were set apart. Those things weren't affecting them. God was distinguishing his people from the Egyptians. He was distinguishing his people from the world. But now why did the first three plagues presumably affect everyone? Because you see, initially, he found that his people were very comfortable with the ways of the Egyptians and their gods. But he was showing not only the Egyptians, but he was showing his people that the things that men place their confidence and trust in aren't worthy of their trust and confidence. The things that men look to, that they revere, that they venerate, aren't worthy of their worship. I'm your God, he says. I'm the one that you should worship. I'm the one that's going to redeem you. I'm the one that's going to bring you unto myself. Of course, all of this builds up. And on the ninth plague, he sends a darkness upon the land of Egypt. A darkness that is so thick it can be felt. And people don't venture out of their homes. And it, I, I think it's more than just the absence of light. It's, it's something almost spiritual. But in Goshen... 
The children of Israel had light. And so the picture there is that in the midst of the darkness, there was light. Arise, shine, for your light is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Darkness shall be upon the nations, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory shall be seen upon you, and kings will be drawn to the brightness of your rising. God, from the very beginning, has painted a picture for us that when darkness is growing more intense, that darkness is, will be the very thing to accentuate the light. In the beginning, there was darkness that covered the face of the deep. But that is when God said, let there be light. And that light in my mind's eye didn't appear in some far remote corner of the universe, but it was in the midst of the darkness. Why? Because he was painting a picture for us that this is our mandate. This is our purpose, to be a light in the midst of the darkness. If you can imagine in your mind's eye a globe of the earth, can you, can you see it in your mind's eye? The earth? Find Israel on that globe. Where is it? It's in the middle. It's in the midst. It's not up here in Siberia. It's not down here in Australia. It's in the midst of the earth. When Jacob blessed Manasseh and Ephraim, he said, let them grow up into a multitude in the midst of the earth. The western border of the state of Israel is the Mediterranean Sea. Mediterranean is a term that means middle earth. So God put Israel in the midst of the nations. Now, in your mind's eye, zoom in a little closer and look at the neighborhood. It's a pretty bad neighborhood, isn't it? I mean, the cardinal rule of real estate is what? Location, location, location. And God picked one of the worst neighborhoods for his people to dwell in. But why? You prepare a table for me in the presence of of mine enemies. The Messiah said that you, we are a, to be a city set upon a hill which cannot be hidden. We are to take the light, not hide it, but to, we are to place it upon the lampstand so that everybody can see the light, and particularly those people who dwell in darkness because you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And why? So that we, being the light, will cause others and provoke others to come out of the darkness into the light. And so in Egypt, the darkness was so thick and so heavy that you could feel it. And people wouldn't venture out of their homes. But there was light in the midst of the darkness. How many of you are under the impression, as I am, that is getting dark outside. And so the time has come once again that God uses Egypt to squeeze his people, but also to distinguish his people from those who dwell in darkness because those people who dwell in darkness need light. Amen? Amen. All of this culminates with the death of the firstborn and in Exodus 12, I'm on verse, uh, excuse me, on page 20 of the Haggadah. He says, for that night I will pass through the land of Egypt and kill the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and animals, and I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. And so that's what happened. And so he went through the land of Egypt, but he had said to the children of Israel, on the 10th day of the month of Eve, I want you to take a male lamb of the first year and it can't have any spots or any imperfections. The Hebrew term tamim means it's lacking nothing. It's perfect. I want you to take it into your homes, and for four days you're going to inspect it. You're going to make sure that there are no imperfections. And on the 14th day of the month, in the afternoon, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to take that lamb and you're going to slaughter it. And you're going to roast it. And by the way, you're not just going to roast the meat, you're going to roast everything. They had to take the innards and roast that with the rest of the lamb. Now, how do you do that? Because you don't want to eat that stuff. So the tradition is, is that they took all of that that they removed from the animal and they wrapped it around its head. And then they took a pomegranate stick and run it up this way and another pomegranate stick and run it this way. 
and stretch that lamb out and roasted it over the fire in that fashion. Did you catch that? And so that's how they roasted that lamb. That's what he instructed them to do. And then they were to take that, the blood from that lamb and it, that fell into the basin at their, the door of their house. And then they took a hyssop branch and dipped it into the basin. And then they put the blood upon the doorposts and the lintels of their home. Now, there is another tradition, if you might find this interesting, that when they did that, they didn't just put a little stripe. They, they actually did it in the form of a Hebrew letter. It's called tav because it's a seal. That's what it means, seal. And the, that letter they used, tav, is shaped like a cross. And so the idea was that in reality what God saw was a bloody cross on their homes. Let's go one step further. One Jewish commentator says that contrary to popular opinion, the blood wasn't on the outside of their homes. It was actually applied to the inside, on the doorposts and lintels of their home on the inside. In other words, the Egyptians didn't see it. Only God saw it. And as they sat and they dipped the matzah and they ate the bitter herbs and they were eating that roasted lamb and they heard the screams in the night because there was not one house in Egypt that didn't have a corpse in it by morning. As they were doing all those things, I can't help but imagine the father of that home was looking up at the door and seeing that blood. Hoping, praying, trusting that God, when he said, when I see the blood, it'll be a sign between you and me. And I will pass over you as a hen passes over her chicks. Remember when Messiah was coming into Jerusalem? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you stone the prophets. How I've longed to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. So think about it this way. If that is true and the blood was on the inside of the home, as God is going through the land looking for the blood, he's not looking on the outside because God does not look at outward appearances. But God looks upon the heart, right? But when I see the blood, I will pass over you and I will not permit the destroyer to come into your homes. And so the destroyer's going through the land and people, the firstborn of Egypt is dying. But God's people are saved because they place their trust in the blood of the lamb. And so that is why we don't have a lamb, but we have a shank bone of a lamb. Because we remember that everything that we're doing here and everything we're remembering, the focal point is the lamb. And so for us to be saved, for Israel to have been redeemed, it meant that an innocent lamb was going to have to lay down its life and be slaughtered, have its blood spilled. And that blood became the sign between them and their God and that's why he saved them, because they placed their trust in the blood of a lamb. In Exodus 12, I'm on verse, uh, uh, page 23. That night they are to eat the meat roasted in the fire. They are to eat it with matzah, unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. And here's how you're to eat it. With your belt fastened, with shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you are to eat it hurriedly because it is the Lord's Passover. The blood will serve as a sign marking the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I strike the land of Egypt, the death blow will not strike you. In Deuteronomy 26, 8, it says, and the Lord brought, up, brought us a brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and with a stretched out arm with great terror and with signs and wonders. And that Hebrew phrase there that's translated stretched out arm is the same word for this bone. In other words, how did he bring them out? It was with the arm of the Lord. And who is the arm of the Lord? It's the lamb. That's what Moses was saying here. And I want you to take your cup. I'm kind of condensing some of this for, for the sake of time. 
But at this point, they would have taken the cup that's called the cup of affliction. Because we're talking about the lamb, the suffering, the death. And we also remember that in our time of joy, somebody had to die for us to be liberated. And so we take the cup. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Borei puri hagafen Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. On page 26, <clears throat> there's um, a part of the Seder, it's called Dayunu, which just means... It would have been enough. It was sufficient. And so at this point, what we, what we want to do is we begin to f reflect on all of the things that the Creator has done for us. And it's kind of built into a song, and I, I won't sing it tonight. But it, basically, you can see it there. It says that the Lord had merely rescued us, but had not judged the Egyptians. And everybody would say, die you knew. That would have been enough. But he did more than that. If he had only destroyed their gods, but had not parted the Red Sea... That would have been enough. Die you knew. But he did more than that. If he had only drowned our enemies, but had not fed us with manna, if he had only led us through the desert, but had not given us the Sabbath, if he had only given us the Torah, but not the land of Israel, die you knew. That would have been enough. But he went beyond that. He went beyond all of that to give us everything. In fact, the Messiah said that he came that we could have life and have it in abundance when he is referred to as El Shaddai the idea is that he's not only our provider but he provides more than what we need he is the all-sufficient one and he gives us and, and bestows upon us these benefits that go beyond and so we we just want to take the time to reflect on the fact that he has done all of these great and wonderful things for us. And you, every individual here, has a story of where he brought you from and where you're at now and what he's doing for you now and what he's going to do in the future. And all of this is going to lead up to one day when we see him as he is. And then we will truly be able to look back and think, wow, if he had only done this and only done that, but look at what he is continuing to do and what he will do. And so it's just a time to start thinking in terms of being grateful and being thankful for all the good that he has bestowed upon us because every good thing comes from his hand. At this point, we would... Uh, we would have a dinner. We would, we would actually just eat. We would be fellowshipping. We'd be talking. We'd be laughing. We might be singing songs. We'd just be enjoying one another's company at this very special time. And then I would say, well, I need that piece of bread that we wrapped in the linen and hid. And so the children would go looking for it. My children grew up doing this. I mean, I'm not Jewish, but this is, my children grew up doing this. We, we don't do Easter egg hunts. We hunt for the afikoman. We hunt for that piece of bread. And so they would go looking for this piece of linen with the bread in it, and whoever found it, they would bring it to me, or they would bring it to the, to the father. And they know that I need the, piece of bread in there so that we can continue on with the Passover Seder. Knowing that, they're going to see, what can I get from you before I give this back to you? And so it's a little game. It's a custom. And smaller kids really enjoy this. But we would negotiate. Well, I want this. Well, I can't do you that, but I can do this. Well, how about this? And we go back and forth until we decide on something. Usually it's something, you know, token. Nothing too extravagant. But I don't have one of those right now, so here's what I'll do. I'll give you something now as a token of, with a promise of more to come. And it's called the promise of the Father. We didn't make that custom up. Once again, the people who don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, 
have customs built into this Seder that continually teach us that Yeshua is the Messiah and the Redeemer of Israel. But we would take the Afikoman, that piece of bread, and Jewish tradition is that that piece of bread that was wrapped, it had been broken, it was wrapped in the linen, it was hidden away, it was buried, if you will, now it's been resurrected. And because we don't have a lamb as a focal point, we have a, a representation of the lamb. This piece of bread, not all the other, but this piece of bread has become uh, synonymous with the lamb. And so then, it's said that after supper, that he took a cup and he took bread. In Luke chapter 22, he said this, and on page 27. This is my body, which is being given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so what you and I know is communion actually comes from this part of the Seder right here. And we take this bread and we remember the Lord's suffering. So he took that bread and he broke it and he blessed Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotze lechem min haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. There's an account in the Gospels where the Messiah is talking to a group of people. And he tells them that the bread that came down out of heaven, that bread represents me because I'm that living bread. The word for bread in Hebrew is lechem. Lechem. And he was born in a place called Bet Lechem. Bethlehem. The house of bread. Everything the Creator does, He's establishing a pattern and He's painting a picture for us. And so when we eat the, the unleavened bread, the one that doesn't have any sin in it, and yet the one who had no sin became that on our behalf. Right? Also, it said that after supper or after the meal, He took a cup and this cup, this third cup, is called the cup of redemption because of those four things that we read at the very beginning, those four things the Creator said He would do. The third one, He said, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Again, arm is the word we use for the shank bone here. So He says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. On page 28, they quote Isaiah in chapter 59. It says, the Lord's arm is not too short to save. It's talking about that word there that represents this bone here. The Lord's arm is not too short to save. And therefore his own arm brought him salvation. And his own righteousness sustained him. I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but the word salvation, in Hebrew we would say Yeshua. Because when the angel appeared to, uh, to Miriam and, she, and, and he spoke to Joseph, said, you're going to call him Jesus, Yeshua, because he will save his people. Yeshua means salvation, but in the present tense. In other words, it means salvation right now. We don't have to wait for it. Today is the day of salvation. What did he tell Zacchaeus? Today, salvation has come to your house. That was a literal statement because salvation went in and had a meal with him. Joshua, who is a prototype of the Messiah, Yehoshua, his name's he will save in the future. He was a, a pattern. But Yeshua means he saves right now. And so all these things that are in the scripture that's you know, in Moses, in the prophets, all those things that the Messiah was going back to and he's talking to those two disciples are a lot of things that unfortunately we've overlooked or we've kind of 
set them off to the side. We haven't really paid much attention to them. And that's a tragedy. And maybe, if, if nothing else, tonight you'll be provoked to go back and dig through some of that and look at your Bible again in a totally different way. Because there's nothing superfluous about the Scripture. It's the Word of God, and it's alive, and it breathes, and it, it's all the time working. So he took the cup after supper. This is in Luke twenty-two twenty. 20. The cup called or associated with redemption. And he said, this cup, this cup is the cup of, of the Brit Chadoshabadami, the new or renewed covenant in my blood. You see, what makes it a better covenant is that it was ratified in his blood. And so he, he took this and he said, this is ratified by my blood, which is being poured out for you. And he took that cup and he blessed. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Borei puri hagafen. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. When we say that blessing, it actually hints at a concept that's prophetic. Because the Messiah told his disciples, I am the true vine. You are the branches. And what is supposed to grow on the branches? The fruit. The fruit of the vine. And so when we are born again of that incorruptible seed, if we are going to bring glory into our Father in heaven, we are to produce much fruit. And so not only was he calling attention to what he was going to do through his death, burial, and resurrection, but it was alluding to what he would do through you and me because of his death, burial, and resurrection. Because we are his body here in the earth today. And what he is doing in the earth today, primarily he's doing it through you and through me. Isn't that right? In fact, that's... Part of the reason he said it is expedient that I go away so that the Father will send the Spirit, which I've told you about, the promise of the Father, and by his Spirit working in and through you, I'm going to affect this world in unprecedented ways. And if you are like me and you believe we're living at the end of days, well... It's a time, he said, would be unlike anything the world has ever seen or will ever see again. And if he's always, from the very beginning of time, worked in and through people, then it would seem to me that the time has come for there to be a people unlike anything the world has ever seen or will ever see again. And it would appear that you and I got picked. And so I'll kind of bring this to a close and we'll... we'll We'll highlight this as we, as we conclude. And on page 29, it, it talks about the prophet Elijah. And let me tell you a little bit about the prophet Elijah. Well, let me tell you about Moses first. Moses, the Bible tells us, was born to a man by the name of Amram and a, a, a woman by the name of Yochavid, who were of the tribe of Levi or Levi. And so we know that Moses was ethnically Israeli. We know his pedigree. We know his genealogy. And when God wants us to know who begot who, he goes to great lengths to tell us this one begot that one, and he begot that one, and he begot that one, right? Because that's the part you skip over when you're reading that, right? But when it comes to Elijah, there is no such information, which is very odd because according to Matthew 17, when the Messiah, after he was transfigured before uh, the disciples, he's coming down the mountain. They've seen Moses and Elijah speaking to him there. And they're asking, you know, why, why did the scribe say that Elijah must come first? And the Messiah said, Elijah will come first and will restore all things. Elijah will restore all things. And that's kind of interesting considering that we don't have any background information on Elijah. All it says is in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, Eliyahu at the Shpimit of Gilead, Elijah the Tishbite, and of the inhabitants of Gilead. That's all the background we've got. He just shows up. But now, I, I don't have a, a lot of time to develop this. You're going to have to take my word for it unless you know Hebrew. 
But Elijah was not a Tishbite because of the place he was from. Elijah was a Tishbite because of the people he came from. And the word Tishbi is a word that means a resident alien, a foreigner, a stranger. In other words, Elijah was not born ethnically Israeli. He was born among the nations. He was a resident alien. He was a stranger. He was a foreigner who had joined himself along with others to the people of Israel. Much like Ruth when she speaks to Naomi and says, wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And most importantly, your God shall be my God. Elijah is standing up there on the top of that mountain with Moses and the Messiah. Two witnesses. One of them is a natural branch. One of them is a wild branch. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet for the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Elijah will indeed come and will restore all things. But when Elijah comes, apparently, he's not some ethnic Israeli. He's not Jewish. He's kind of like you and me, who've been grafted into and become part of this family of faith. But here's why it's important for us to see that in relation to what we're doing here tonight. Because Friday night, our Jewish friends will get together and they'll have tables set. And at the end of the table, they'll have an empty place setting. There'll be an empty chair. And that chair is reserved for Elijah. Because they believe that before the Messiah returns, that God will send Elijah the prophet to herald the coming of the Messiah. And so every Pesach, at this point in the Seder, the children will rise from the table, they will go to the front door, and they'll open the door, and they'll look outside, and everybody will sing, Eliyahu Hanavi, Eliyahu HaTishbi, Eliyahu HaGilyadi, Elijah the Tishbite, Elijah the Prophet, Elijah the Gileadite, and then they will sing, May he come speedily in our days, for with him comes Mashiach ben David, or the Messiah, son of David. But if Elijah wasn't born ethnically Israeli, but actually was someone that was born among the nations that joined themselves to the people of God and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, if he's a picture of you and me, then when they open the door and they look for Elijah to come and sit down at the Passover table with them and break matzah with them, who are they looking for? And you remember what happens to people whose eyes have been dimmed to see and to recognize the Messiah when matzah is broken. And so, we take the last cup. Because as I said in the beginning, not only are we remembering the Lord's death until he comes, as Paul said, but we are also looking ahead to when he comes and what is going to happen as a result of his coming. Paul put it this way in Ephesians chapter 2. Now, remember that you once being Gentiles of the flesh, that you were cut off from the covenants of promise, having no hope, that you were not part of the commonwealth of Israel. And he goes on and talks about we were just, we were lost. But the Messiah has come now, he says, and he has broken down the middle wall of separation so as to make in himself one new man, to bring those two together and make them one so that he would present them as to as one body unto the Father. And therefore, in verse 19 of Ephesians 2, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And if there's anything that deserves our praising our Creator, is that those of us who are far off have now been brought near. How? By the blood of the Messiah, right? And that is deserving of our praise. And so this cup is called the cup of Hallel, or the cup of praise. When we say hallelujah, we are saying let us praise Yah. Let us praise the Lord. And so let us give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. In him who alone has done great wonders. To him who has skillfully made the heavens. To him who spread out the earth on the water. To, in him who made the great lights. To the sun to rule the day. The moon and the stars to rule the night. 
to him who struck down Egypt's firstborn and brought Israel out from among them with a mighty hand with an outstretched arm to him who split the sea and made Israel cross through it but swept Pharaoh and his army into the sea to him who has led his people through the desert let us give thanks to the God of heaven for his grace endures forever. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Borei puri hagafen, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. And then that we would conclude our Seder by saying, Lashon Ba'ah Next year in Jerusalem, or maybe one day in the new Jerusalem. Amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody. I hope that you enjoy this.